And prove it, peeps. Buckle up. If you're in the car, get your safety belt a little bit tighter. If you're walking, find a seatbelt. Because today's episode is so good. It's so good. Today, we are chatting with Cy Wakeman, all about ditching the workplace drama. And Cy... Sorry, Sai, you're my new bestie. Sai is a drama researcher, which is a career she discovered accidentally and has since quantified how much drama there actually is in the workplace. We're going to talk about this in the show. Her research has shown that the average employee spends nearly 2.5 hours per day in drama, gossiping, tattling, withholding buy-in, resisting change, and stepping down from accountability. Drama is emotional waste. Any unproductive thought or behavior, and like any other waste in the workplace, Sai believes drama can be eliminated through great mental processes. Now, her work is focused on giving leaders tools to recapture that emotional waste and upcycle it into results. Sai started Reality-Based Leadership, her company, in order to teach leaders and individual contributors ways to lead in reality that diffuses drama in the workplace. They have formed that into an organization that does leadership development, speaking and training, and publishes unconventional tools and leadership programs to use to diffuse drama in the workplace. Oh my gosh, this episode, y'all, is just unbelievable it was so what so refreshing to talk to Sai. i'm gonna stop talking and get right to it let's improve it with the one the only Sai wakeman hi new friend i'm aaron deal business improv edutainer fail fluencer and keynote speaker who is ready to help you improve your it it being the thing that makes you you, you. So think of me as your keeping it real professional development bestie who is here to help you develop yourself into the best version of you possible. So you can develop your team and lead with intentionality, transparency, and authenticity. Oh, and did I mention we're improving your it through play? That's right. I'm an improvisational comedy expert who uses experiential learning to help you have your aha (laughs) moment. Those are the moments when the light bulb goes off and you're laughing at the same time. So grab your chicken hat, your notebook, and your inner child because I'm going to take you on a journey that is both fun and transformative. Welcome to the Improve It Podcast. Okay, Sai, welcome to the Improve It Podcast. I'm, I am like jazzed like i have a jazz hand about you being here today so (laughs) welcome welcome tell us where you're coming in from i i know but tell everybody i'm coming in oceanfront north of cabo san lucas i live in baja mexico in paradise i mean goals these are goals so i am so excited to chat with you you have done some incredible work You are putting fantastic work into the world. Our theme of the show this month is love. And I'm so excited to chat with you because you talk all about ditching this workplace drama, bringing more love into the fold, which some leaders kind of get a little squeamish when you say love at work, but it's really what makes the world go round. So I want to just start by setting an intention. What is one word you would like to give our audience today? You already said that it's love. I'm actually someone who talks from the stage at all corporate events about the two roles of a leader. You got to love people up and then only then do you get the permission to call them up to greatness. And I used to teach a lot about accountability and calling people up. And then I realized, given our response to the people during the pandemic, like we, I just assumed people were loving people up all the time. But I found out I had to go back and revisit those lessons because a leader can't love somebody else up if they've got no self-love for themselves. And so if I can't be compassionate when I make a mistake or can't get it all done or don't look seemingly like I'm holding it together, how could I ever give that to my employee? And that's why it's so important. Like, Know your own biases because what you can't love about yourself or about others, you can't give to your employees. Your employees can't give to your customers. Oh, my God. It's, it's like, 
You took the words right out of my mouth. I'm, I got to, we got to talk. Side. There's so many things <laughs> that I'm wait. like, yes, yes, yes. And I'm so here for that because you really can't give out love unless you feel that in your, in your own body, in your own mind, in your own soul. So I love that's our intention. And we think we can, like we love our kids, but that is met with resentment when your kids aren't grateful enough for how hard you worked for them. Like that's not love. What we're doing right now in work is so transactional and so little transformational because we're doing it with the motive of, Sai, what do I say to get my people to be more productive? I'm like, I want to talk about how you can be to hold space for willing productivity And that's a a whole different way of moving through the world because as a leader, then you're not um, resentful. You're just asking for what you need. You're treating people well. But the key is, is is it's like if you over rotate on love and engagement, engagement without accountability creates entitlement. And if you over rotate on just accountability, calling people up with no love, that creates resentment. Mm. Like there's, really the only one way to be able to love outwardly is to evolve yourself inwardly. The more you evolve, the more you can walk through your external world skillfully and with love. So my ability to love big externally has a lot to do with the wisdom I've forged internally. And so in my company, we have two hashtags. We don't even have a vision or a mission or we have hashtag evolve yourself and hashtag love wins always. So oh like that's if you're part of our company, work your program and love each other and we'll do great things together. Okay. We're meant to meet. We're, I'm sorry. You're now stuck with me for a really long time. I hope you know that. I'm very here for this. And what's interesting is in April on this show, our theme was evolution and May's theme is inner child. So you're really developing yourself, developing that inner child and incorporating that play, getting back to your true self so you can get to this point of self-love, which is why you are here. I'm so thrilled. Like you just tied that in beautifully. So let me ask you this. You're a drama researcher and you said in your bio or somewhere I read that you stumbled into this accidentally. So how did this happy accident happen? You know, and and it goes to your theme too, like improv, if we're turning towards each other and as these moments open up, you have any ability inside you to say yes, even if it's a like F yes, like, dang, I don't want to do this, but well, I had one project left in my master's degree and like I had such senioritis, I had a one-year-old, two-year-old child, I was like, I just need this degree done. It was like going on weekends and evenings. And so I um, was implementing a new medical record with some clinics that I was a leader in. And the biggest complaint the physicians had was it will kill our productivity. It will take more time to put all of this in the computer. They were used to just tape recording it into a little recorder and we'd send it off to transcription. So I came up for my final project. I would time track the reality of that. I knew how much time they spent talking into recorders because you pay transcription by the minute. And so I thought if I could put observers in a few of their exam rooms, they could get information from me, how much time the physician spent on the patient, how much time a fluent physician who could type spent on the medical record. And I would compare that, write up a paper, I am graduated. And then I gave them two columns. I got it through my professors. I gave the observers write down patient time, computer time. And within like an hour, the observers called me and they said, we need a third column. And I was horrified because it was all approved. I really needed the data, write the paper of the weekend, I'm done. And something inside me said, oh my gosh, you got to listen to this. And I said, what would the third column be? And they said, how much time the physician spends complaining about the patient or the computer? Wow. And my first, it was two and a half hours a day. And I thought, maybe the physicians in my clinic are big whiners. And so I couldn't help. I had to do it with other places. I thought maybe it was physicians. It was nurses. I thought maybe it was healthcare. It was beyond healthcare. Every time we replicated the study, and in 2016, we did a huge, really solid piece of research to to write my book, No Ego, with the Futures Company. And they looked across industry. They 
you know, really quantified that the average person, good employee working hard, spends two and a half hours a day in drama in the workplace, emotional waste, energy not going towards results and well-being at work. And we're all trying to have people be more productive and we're all trying to get people, you know, not so burned out at work. And when I brought this forward that I could save 816 hours a year per headcount, not just they weren't working, but working with the grudge, like it would immediately change engagement, workplace, accountability. And I knew how to do it because I was a therapist that had turned leadership guru. It was unbelievable breakthrough in my career. That is fascinating. Unbelievable. Everything in me wanted to say no. And yeah. I would curious this moment in improv because like, I know my improv partner and he takes me someplace and I'm like, I am freaking on stage. You just did not just do this. Everything in me wants to say no, yeah. because I have this suspicion where you're setting me up here and I can't contain my laughter. And like, I'm going to, I'm now became the butt of the skit and I cannot believe we're going there. And it like almost is like, this is going to be like, I can't stand how good this is going to be. It was that feeling, but yet I knew the rules. I'm just like, oh, yes. Tell me what the third column should be. You're like, let me lead it. Okay. So many, like I have so many follow-up questions. The first one that is so important in my mind, you've done improv. I've done improv. Okay. Tell me this, like, Tell, tell me all the things, where, how, how long, all the stuff. So what's so funny is when I get on stage, I speak to thousands of people on stage and people are like, you're so brave. You're so courageous. I'm actually an introvert. I am not scared when I get up because people don't realize like when you're giving a big monologue, you're in control completely. There's nothing vulnerable about getting on stage and giving a monologue unless you didn't prepare. Right. And so, and I always had kind of a hard time in theater as like wardrobe makeup girl, because I was never like back in the 80s, the skinny, tall, blonde girl that got all the like leading parts. And so I went to this improv training. It, I've only done like a little bit, but it's something I really would love to perform in the future. I went to this improv training and I walk in and I've never felt more vulnerable more like asked to do this. I thought I am free as a bird. I am the most uninhibited person. I can perform on demand. Like, and having to just get a beach ball thrown at me and like come up with some <laughs> wordplay, I was just like, everybody's yeah. looking at me. Everybody see, I never felt more like curling up in the fetal position in my lifetime. And then I started to see how so much of what I taught in my leadership um, that it should be a new leadership competency because people's, they want to handle uncertainty with like, tell me the script and let's block it out and choreograph it and plan it end to end and, and, and really cuddle our people. So they have nothing to do, but read the script. And I'm like, no, more people need to get down and dirty um, with improv. I became, so I haven't done that a lot, but I became a constant believer in it as a life skill. And I couldn't believe how hard it was. Like I went to 15 years of therapy and improv brought up issues I did not even know I had. All my junior high issues came up. All of my mother issues came up. Like all of my dad, that's what I was talking about in that scene. This guy started to take this thing down this really raunchy sexual path. Every issue I had, I'm like, you are not doing this. I told you that in private and now you are doing this. I hate you so bad. And I want an A in the improv class. So yeah. I will say yes to this, but it's very wrong. I love this so much. My cheeks actually are like hurting right now because I'm like, I'm smiling the whole way while you're talking about this because it's so true. And I will tell you too, improv, in my opinion, first of all, I love that you've done it. I love that you know the application. I love that you see the connection. It is this beautiful art form, but can I just tell you, it's hilarious what you said, and I love that you have this therapy background. I actually started doing improv and treated it as if it was therapy. Amazing. And there's a lot of therapeutic models, Erin, that do that. Like yes. reality, you know, we used to do family sculpting, which is improv. Set a chair in front of somebody, which is like- yep. There's so many methods and um, 
Richard Swartz's internal family systems yes. uses a form of improv in um, its work. He'll put two unrelated people together and have them improv off each other in a out of their own issues, which improv really, of course, is out of our own issues. But totally. that's why some of the most funny improv people have some issues. Like they aren't afraid of getting in the mess. I mean, a thousand percent. And it's so, it's so funny. There's so many things I want to just dive down into this rabbit hole with you about you being an introvert because a lot of my team, I have 22 facilitators. I would say 18 of them say they're introverts and come alive on stage. We all hash it out on stage. I mean, there's there's so much that um, I see in your work that is relatable to the improv stage. And I love that you, yes, and did that third column because we need that third column. Okay. And we need that. We need that 2.5 hours in our research because you have used it to create amazing content. You talk a lot about ego in your work, which is something that I am completely fascinated about. I am currently a student in the metaphysical text, of course, in uh, Miracles. So I'm really studying this. And you even have a book called No Ego, which is a New York Times bestseller. Okay, Sai, so exciting. Congrats to you on that. Thank you. So I want to know, you talk a lot in this book from, from the research I saw, a lot about the strategies that you can use for eradicating entitlement, and that can help change the energy of group meetings. I, I want to hear, if you're able to, just a tool that would be helpful that if somebody is going through a negative energy vibe in their team right now, what is something that you can do to help eradicate that entitlement? First of all, any entitlement comes when people are seeing the world through the lens of ego. So a single question for self-reflection can break up that entitlement. So if somebody comes to me and it's like, oh my gosh, have you heard they didn't, now they're out to get me and I know what this is about. And it's like, Time out. What do you know for sure? That single question can really unlock the ego's grip on our view of the world. It changes everything without changing anything. So it's like, well, actually, I don't. Well, I have a question for you. If you closed your eyes and softened your heart and softened your mind, would there maybe be a more kind um, explanation for what's happening? And people are like, oh my gosh, I'll go work it out. Like it instantly just plugs and plays them differently. But my favorite tool I use a lot with teams is called thinking inside the box. A lot mm. of folks think outside the box and they 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 um, have a problem in their group and they're like, let's think outside the box. What ideas do you have for how we could fix this? And what that does for leaders is it gets you and reality so confused in the eyes of your people. Because they come up with a, a, a way to fix the problem that includes spending money, adding people, um, you know, a lot of resources committed to changing, you know, reality. And each time they bring something up, you probably are in a position where you can't say yes, you have to say no. And if you do it differently and do what I call thinking inside the box, you already pre-agree on what some of the solid constraints are. And then you use my favorite word, given that. How could we? And you'll be amazed at the difference. Quick example, I had a team who needed to improve cleanliness of the, the unit they were operating in a hospital. Patient satisfaction scores rated them lower than benchmark. I went into a meeting. I said, what ideas do you have? They're like, oh, we could have environmental services clean three times a day. And I was like, oh, I love your thinking. And I just have to let you know that they can't because they're like understaffed and they were going to ask us to do it just once a day. And then they're like, oh, I know we could restore the unit. It needs painting. I'm like, well, you know, actually, that's capital budget, like 2035. And the team thinks I'm reality. They're like, Sai, we come up with great solutions. You keep saying no. And instead going in and saying, okay, let's draw a box. What are our constraints? Budget, environmental services, we still have to increase cleanliness. Given those constraints, think inside the box, how could we? And it puts people in a position, given a reality that they can still have impact, and it pops them into instant accountability. Every one of our tools, is it's pre-designed in there, a good mental process, 
and good processes are how you get rid of waste and drama is emotional waste. So how you get rid of emotional waste, good mental processes, it's all built in. And we give you a no ego, like I think it's 12 different tools that are that easy to use. Oh my God. Okay. My mind is blown here because this is like a version of yes and that I've never heard before. This is beautiful. Yeah. I just saw that connection as we were, as I was talking about yes. it. I'm like, yeah. Because everybody's like, no. And here's why. Instead yes. of what could we say yes to? Oh my God. I love this so much. And this is also brings you to your other book, which is reality based leadership, which I want to talk about too. But I, I love this because you said this in your speaker reel. You said leaders don't manage people. They manage energy. And I love that you just said drama is waste. How do you get rid of waste? You create processes that help increase that productivity and you get rid of that that expended negative energy. So tell me, a li- can you just elaborate on that? quote that you said so beautifully. I love it. Like I'm sorry. I just, I feel like the synergy of our work is so beautiful. And I, you've, you just do it in this really cool way that feels really just genuine and and authentic and, and reality based. Let me say that, but it, it just roots it in reality. And it brings this lens of love to leadership and to work, which I'm so here for just full circle moment for me. Okay. Love it. Love it. Back to you. Okay. Tell us about the energy, managing energy. Yeah. And a lot of people say, you know, oh, so your philosophy, reality-based leadership is like tough love. And I'm like, no, reality is tough. Leadership's love, but it's got to be like healthy love. If I'm protecting you from reality and you can confuse it with me and I'm buffering reality for you. You're not getting good feedback or good information to make better decisions. So I believe in a wholeness of the leadership competencies that we haven't heard before in the workplace. And one of them is that leaders don't manage ener- or people. They manage the energy of people. And the main direction you want to manage energy is away from why we can't and why we shouldn't have to, to what if we could, how could we? And about a thousand times a day, we're picking up that energy. And drama is is energy, and it's energy that is not being put into well-being and results at work. And so it's like this waste. It's this emotional waste. So when I started to see how much drama was out there, two and a half hours per person, and For me, it wasn't about productivity as much as it's time people are spending feeling miserable unnecessarily because it's like joy or misery, same day, your choice. And this isn't just toxic positivity, but it's like really finding a place where you can be inside that box joyfully. And it was like so much of the waste when I looked at continuous improvement, if it was waste they would get rid of it through a process. And I started thinking, hey, I have a counseling background. If it's emotional waste, I can just teach people better mental processes, whether it's a tool or a question. And I started to see that as a leader, my whole role was to help people understand how their mind works so they quit getting played by their ego and to understand how the world works so they stop arguing with reality which is is an argument they'll lose like 100% of the time, and just say, yes, given this, what can we do? And it brings people into this point of impact. If there's an unpreferred reality and you want a different future, there's this tiny little space that you got to get into because your choices in that space connect an unpreferred reality to a different future. And every one of our tools tries to get people with in their own energy, their own agency, and then put those individuals' energy towards what if we could. And that's what leaders are doing. They're managing the energy of individuals. Let's toggle up and use all of your intelligence, not just your primitive ego brain. And then I'm going to bring all of you together with a tool, with a good process, so that energetically now I've aligned those energies. So it's like it's like getting a tuning fork going and then getting all the tuning forks going and then getting all the frequencies focused together. I'm going to retape that for you because I don't know why my do not disturb. Oh, no, that's okay. Leave it in. Leave it in. No mistakes, only gifts. I, that's oh, I side. love that. Really Fail, yeah. No mistakes, only gifts. Fail, yeah. I love that. So it, it's like, 
if energy, if if leaders could get out of the personal of what makes this person tick and you know what can I say that they won't personally get out of that. Just manage energy of people to its highest frequency and then put all those little frequencies together to good for the world. Like it's managing energy. Oh my God. I love it so much. And there's like, there's so many ways to, I hate this phrase, so many ways to skin a cat. And are people out there skinning cats? Do people, so- do people, yeah, there are, there yeah. are. I know that's so bad. Uh, don't skin cats. They need fur. And what, what neighbor that you're talking to when they say that, like you don't realize they're really real, like it mean it? Right. And you're right. like, <laughs> that's what he you're does like, at night. That's right. In his garage with the light on. Um, but so, no, I love this because a lot of what I hear you say is like reframing the no to a yes and. It's re- it's giving that, and it, I love that you talk about it's not positive uh, or positive toxicity or toxic positivity. That's the right way to say that because it's not. This is literally helping human beings just have a better human experience at work and feel seen, heard, and valued. And when they can do that, then that's when the productivity and everything happens. We get rid of that waste. I just love this side. Well, what I love is that the ego, yes, and if you want to argue, you know, it's no, and here's why. Ego, the ego, yes, and bypasses the ego. And it just says, what can we agree on? And then here's where your input's needed. How can we make that happen? And most people still want to talk about whether it should be done at all. Yeah. And that's where we get get stuck rather than like, if that's where the organization wants to go and it's not illegal, immoral or marginalizing some population or it's not unethical, like really focus on what if you could say yes. And a lot of people won't say yes because they think they're saying yes to all of it. They're like, just say yes to the strategy and then join me in the how. That's your place for impact. Your Mm. place for impact isn't questioning the decision. If you have a flag, throw it on the field if it's unethical. But if we're just talking strategy, the way I see it when I learn the strategy of a company I'm working with, unless I can throw a flag on the field or I withdraw from playing, right? I need to say yes and and bring my expertise to help them with the how. And that's putting a lot over my own preferences. And that's where it, it's vulnerable. You know, and, and a lot of times we are in these conversations, these no conversations. And I'm just telling leaders, I'm like, if that's the conversation that you're in at that energy level, just end all exhausting conversations. Yeah. And start a new one. Like just, yeah. you know what? We've had this conversation. I'm just going to back away from it. And and I think that's the problem with like coming back to work is somebody's like, I want the improv set to go this way. And somebody's like, no, I want it to go this way. I'm like, why don't we meet? All of our dad is three years old. Why don't we meet and start having conversations about how it would make sense to work together in the new world, given how we've evolved and been evolved by the last three years and the turning towards one another and being vulnerable and being willing to create something is the work you do. It's the work I'm teaching people to, you know, begin again. There's so much between our work, but that the reason there's so much between our work is they're both based on universal principles that have been around forever. If you feel sad and separate, it's because you separated through your ego into a no stance. If you want to feel love and belong, then say yes, turn towards us and rejoin the human race. Because the whole world's a mess and you can still be happy. Like we're our lives are messy. And that was I just had a book come out last year called Life's Messy Live Happy. It's all those personal lessons. Oh my God. Sigh. I'm talking too much though. No, you're not. This is like, this is literally summing up everything that I truly believe in. Like that last, that last chunk right there is we could just mic drop in. Like just if you turn towards the light, if you make yourself give love internally, you can give it externally. And then by giving it externally, you're going to receive it back. And that is literally how the world works. And if we could just bring that to work, we could ditch this drama. Absolutely. And you know why people aren't able to do this right now? They're underskilled. They're underskilled in new competencies like holding space, trusting the process, making amends, 
um, using feelings as information, like tuning into their gut, like using breath to come back to their bodies somatically. Like there's a whole new set of evolutionary, they aren't even development, evolutionary competencies that we need to be able to do stuff in the, in the workplace. Like if I don't do my boundary work, I can't love because I'm too underskilled at it. Without oh boundaries, God. I got, I can't love. It's too dangerous. Like, cause I don't know where I start and you end. I love this topic. I didn't think we were going to go there, but I want to talk about it because I think boundaries are so important, especially when it comes to our, our topic of love, this concept, and just this overarching theme of ditching that workplace drama. If somebody, from a workplace standpoint, let me just ask you what you do. What is a healthy boundary that you set at work that has changed the way you show up? So be. For I give you an example, most people think I set boundaries to dictate how the world should work, like how my staff should be like, don't call you don't call me after eight o'clock. But boundaries are me not trying to control you. They're me telling you where the place you and I can meet where I can love you and me at the same time. And they aren't just like non negotiables, they're desires, preferences, um, limits. Like, I'm not good and need a break before I answer that question. So when I'm learning to set boundaries, I'm telling people, if this happens, here's how I will respond, not what I need you to do. I have a desire if you want to meet that great. And so some of the um, boundaries I have set have not at all been for my team. They've been giving my team permission to be my um, front-facing boundaries And every boundary I set in my business had to do with overcoming a fear of mine. And so I used to put two weeks of hiking vacation on the calendar a year ahead of time and then torture myself by saying, well, if it's a good deal or if if they're like, if it's full price, like call me. And I mean, I have that marked off, but like, you know, I just, um, and so I kept it open. And so for a year I was tortured about the vacation I was hoping to take. And I would take like one thing make my vacation all disrupted. And so what I started doing, I don't really have like, don't call me at certain hours. Or I won't work certain days, but I go through and every month just really block off beautiful things that I'm creating space for in my life. And a lot of it happens to be hiking right now. And then I just trust my staff and I trust the universe that I'll get enough. Like I quit trying to grow my business. I'm just like, my new boundary is enough. I just need enough. Oh my God. God. And so my whole team decided what enough was. I wrote a chapter on this in the book. My whole team decided what enough was. And now that's all we do. And they're like, grow 10%. No, like we have enough. Like, let's just do enough. And so like when we are close to enough, like we just don't work that much harder. We are anti-hustle culture. The biggest boundary I set is I'm just, I don't buy into the whole hustle thing. I don't either. I'm so here from this. Yeah. I get the same success, whether I hustle or not. I'm just happier when I don't hustle. But the success is the same. That's the biggest solution to wake up to is that a lot of times, if you do the basics, all that extra stuff you do is just you keeping you distracted while the universe births like the most beautiful dream. That's just keeping you busy so you don't screw it up. But when you learn to be able to just sit and keep your hands off of it, you can have a lot more free time. Oh my God. You know what? It took me seven years of running this business to finally come to that conclusion. And I don't, I don't, I've never used the words. It's what's enough. I love that. That's our new favorite word is what is, is enough. I have three favorite words and which you love. Yes. Um, given which I love and enough. In fact, in my book, Life's Messy, Live Happy, not to keep bringing that up. I wrote a chapter on each one of those words. Okay. We got to get the book. We got to, I got to read this book. I am so here for this conversation. You are such a light. I feel like every single person listening to the show needs to take, it will take away a single nugget for them. For me, it's enough. Like I'm taking that with me. I'm bringing that into the fold. That was so beautiful. I want to ask you this because this is a question I ask every guest and our name of the company is Improve It. And that it is, I think your passion, your thing, the thing you were, the it you were brought to this earth 
to do that contract you signed when you said size coming. So what is size it? What do you say? What do you think your it is? I believe my it is to live in this messy world out loud so that you can all see what living in the mess looks like. So I will take my lessons as they come. I'll do my best to self-reflect and learn them. And then I'll do my best to report out to others. I don't think I can save anybody from any lessons. I think we were born with our own flavor of trouble we need to get into and through. But I do think I can help people feel less alone as they're out there in the mess doing this thing really imperfectly. So I think that what I bring as my gift is this thing where in a weird way, I have little shame about like, oh, yeah, I did that. And um, here's what I learned. And you're welcome to try it. So I think I can live out loud and allow other people the same privilege So I don't need to live out loud and save you from anything. I'm just going to like live out loud. And so if you need something to focus on while you're living out loud, like look over here, I'm doing that. I screwed up daily. Um, So if you need an example of that, like look over here. So I think I kind of like have lived a really cool, imperfect life on stage for other people to, to take what that, what helps and leave the rest. Oh my God. I'm so here for that. Fail. Yeah. Fail yeah, fail yeah, fail yeah. I adore you. I am so grateful you came on the show. You really gave this word love a new meaning. I feel like everyone here needs to read your books, do all the things. So tell everybody where they can find you. Absolutely. So our website, which no one really probably uses anymore, is realitybasedleadership.com. We are all over social media at Cy Wakeman at Alex Dorr, at RBL, but you'll learn all those. Just go to at Cy Wakeman. And my books are all over the place. I have a great podcast called No Ego. And if you go back to like some of the early seasons, you'll get like tons of free training. So Ugh. I encourage you um, to find us there. Oh my God. The TikTok is my newest. I just had some video. I've had a bunch, but like 2.1 million views. <gasps> and people are like, you're hitting it on TikTok. I'm like, I... Don't really use it. I don't either. Okay. Team. <laughs> yes. Good job, team. Okay. Well, we'll find you on the Tiki Taki. I'm going to, I Taki. connected with you on LinkedIn, which is how I, my team found you. And I'm just obsessed with you. And I'm so grateful. I'm thrilled about it, Erin. And I just, I'm so glad we met. What a cool thing. Me too. Oh my God. Forever. And you're ever a part of the Improvement Peeps here. Okay. You're up. You're forever a part of this, this crazy little community that we have in the best way, like the best, most fun, caring people. They care about the people that they serve and they just want to show up and do great things. And that's what you're doing. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. Tell your team. Thanks for connecting us. I will. All right. Bye, Sai. Bye. Improve it, peeps. I don't even know how to top this conversation. It was so good. It was so good. So if you're somebody listening and this title caught your eye because you have workplace drama, re-listen to this episode. If you're somebody listening and this title caught your eye and you press play because you're causing workplace drama, (laughs) replay this episode. Send this episode to anyone in your organization who you know could implement change. And here is your other piece of homework. Number one is to share it. Share it, share it, share it, because it is so good. There's so many juicy chicken nuggets of wisdom in here that Cy brings forth. The second piece is to take one of those juicy chicken nuggets of wisdom and apply it. So for example, my takeaway from today is just do enough. When Sai said that, it spoke to my soul. There's not a number. There's not a single piece of revenue. There's not a single thing that you can do higher than that enough to make you feel like you've achieved. So define enough for you, for your organization, for your team, and then live out loud, as Sai told us in her it. Use the rest of that time to develop yourself, to develop yourself personally, professionally, But that enough spoke to me so much today. 
Because when we understand our own enoughs, when we understand our own selves, when we understand the higher power that is connected to us, and we really dive into what motivates us, what drives us, and love ourselves, we're able to give that to our teams. And that output is reciprocal. You're going to receive that love back. We're going to ditch that workplace drama with that love. And we're going to connect in a way that is so meaningful and allows people to show up in a, in a mission-driven fashion because they believe in what they're doing because they feel the love that they're given and they give that love outwardly to others, especially themselves. So you know what I'm going to say and prove it, peeps. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it. Please share it. And then also keep failing, keep improving because this world needs that very special it, your it, that only you can bring. I'll see you back here next week. Bye. Hey friend, did you enjoy today's show? If so, head on over to iTunes to rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Now, did I mention that when you leave a five-star review of the Improve It podcast, an actual team of humans does a happy dance? Mm -hmm, That's right. So leave a review for us on iTunes, screenshot it, and send me an email at info at learntoimproveit.com. I'll send you a personalized video back as a thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Improve it, peeps. I'll see you next Wednesday.